joining us. Oh, I'm s I use this. Yes. Well, use this Hello. to welcome our live friends stream. on HowlRound live stream. Welcome. Uh, and, uh, and to our friends here, thanks for coming to hang out for a few minutes with us. Uh, Derek, thank you very much for, uh, it, uh, we were talking last night about how people are appropriately expressing gratitude and love for Derek consistently through this gathering. And although it pains me to publicly share love with him, um, <laughs> it, is, it is well deserved because he is extraordinary. And, uh, and his work and his team's work in making this happen and Georgetown's support is extraordinary. So thank you for having us here. Uh, and I feel um, very lucky to get to be up here with two folks I get to call real friends and colleagues, Jasmine and Mark, who I'll make space to introduce yourselves in a moment. Um, and we were um, conscious of um, wanting to use this time well. And Jasmine and Mark have given me permission to sort of play timekeeper in the way that we're gonna uh, progress. So I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna take my five minutes of context now, and then they're each gonna have 10 minutes. They're each gonna have five minutes to sort of give a little context for their work, and then five minutes to give a specific example. And then I'm gonna do my specific five minute example, and that leaves us about half the time for conversation here and conversation here. Um, so my five minutes will start now, <laughs> yeah? Because uh, that was the intro, and here's my five minutes. Uh, my five minutes is about the fact that as Derek and I talked about this gathering, hello Jessica, as we talked about this, um, something that he was very um, uh, thoughtful about, and which I was deeply appreciative of, was an awareness that the spectrum of work that we're all involved in, the intersection of theater and change and community and community development, uh, is a really broad array of practices situated in lots of different kinds of institutions and contexts. But very frequently, when theater people get together to talk about the power of theater in relation to change in community, we very often talk about the productions and what surrounds the productions. Because of course, that's kind of the heart of our historical practice and also what's most visible and often most understood. There's also lots of people here at this event who work not just in what might be seen as a traditional presentational production, but in many participatory and very engaged and community-based kind of ways. I, I was excited for the opportunity to talk about civic practice, which is something that an organization I'm a part of, the Center for Performance and Civic Practice, has kind of been trying to articulate for artists across disciplines as a way of working, not because we think it's new or that we're attempting to sort of label other people's work, but there's a lot of challenges um, for artists in many disciplines, including theater, to kind of frame the work they're doing in community that looks like process as a not marginal, but often central part of how artists engage in communities. Uh, and in particular, when artists engage in communities with partners in the community development world, or partners in the policy world or even the legislative world. And so what I wanted to do as a frame was to acknowledge that um, Mark and Jasmine are theater artists who they make shows, they tell stories, they make projects and productions that look like the rigorous and aesthetically adventurous work that we all do in various ways. They're also artists among many others out there who bring their assets as makers and as process designers to the work of organizing and to the work of problem solving and coalition building in spaces where their artistry is present. They are engaged in the act of theater making, but it sometimes looks different, narrates different, and is different legibly. So <laughs> this conversation is um, an opportunity that I'm grateful to have to sort of acknowledge that work that's happening around this country and around the world where folks are saying, I make, but the tools I use to make are also useful in moments that are not just about generating my fully produced creative output, but are actually useful in the generating of community outcomes. And the way I participate in contributing to community outcomes in instances of civic practice may look more like listening to residents and community organizers that I engage with and figuring out how my assets can be thoughtfully put into collaboration with community outcomes that are community defined rather than artist led. 
and then artists bring their practice to those moments and make and contribute and design and lead process and practices. Again, we all make stuff in here that looks like things that might happen on this stage or outside of the stage, but we're also deploying our practice in collaboration with folks who don't self-define as artists towards community-defined outcomes. And that's what I've asked Jasmine and Mark to speak a little bit about, and that's what I'm gonna speak a little bit about, and then kind of invite um, the conversation. But I wanted to start with that frame of civic practice uh, in relationship to listening, relationship building, and deploying those assets with a real specific set of intentionalities. So how'd I do on my five? Good setup, you did it. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> okay, good, and that was true, <laughs> not a lie, which was the room I was in before where I was doing a lot of <laughs> lying. Um, that's another session. Um, so uh, Jasmine, do you want me to do the five and five or, or just give you the 10? Five and five would be great. Okay, so again, when I interrupt my friend and colleague, I've been given permission to and I've been asked to. That yes. is important. So the first five will start now. So um, my name is Jasmine Cardenas. I live and work in Chicago. And as an artist uh, working with Looking Glass Theater Company, doing a play about working people, I met an organization called the Chicago Workers Collaborative. And over the course of a year, working with them as an assistant director and as a community engaged engagement connection person, I learned a lot about what was happening with Chicago Workers Collaborative. And that production opened and closed and was incredible, but was very different from the experiences that the people, temp workers, precarious workers, are experiencing, the challenges they're experiencing in Chicago and across our country and across the world. So I said to the executive director, Tim Bell, Tim, I use this technique called theater of the oppressed, and I would love to work with the group in some way just to see if it might be something that could help what you're doing. And Tim said yes, which made all the difference in the world. Tim had been using theater in the style of uh, Teatro Callejero in the streets with uh, an e eerie neighborhood house like 20 years before that. So he understood the power of theater to work in communities, and so, we started working Theater of the Oppressed. Uh, I brought it to them as a tool, like just as an idea, and immediately it was resonating because precarious workers and temp workers are people uh, who go to a temp office, not a college degreed person who then ends up as a Google assistant somewhere in a Google office, not that kind of temp worker. They go to an office and then they get told to jump on the bus that's waiting for them and they get taken out to a factory out in the suburbs of Chicago or in the city limits and they work on, uh, on the line making effing vodka or uh, next to ovens, very hot ovens where they make baked goods that they sell at grocery stores in Chicago or where they make the Costco pizza or where they, you know, um, Amazon is a shipping center and they are working very hot in very extreme conditions whether it's a very cold freezer because it's a packing, meat packing factory or very hot ovens. And then um, they make minimum wage or sub minimum wage. Uh, most precarious workers are immigrants or returning citizens. And so uh, by that I mean many of the workers are African Americans who get gotten out of prison and want a job. And uh, they, they say they don't check your background that it's, that's okay, but what we've learned over the course of our work together is that Latino immigrants are treated very different than African American precarious workers. And there is, um, there, from the point of the temp agency and the factory owner, there is a uh, hierarchy. And uh, the preferred one is the one that is scared, doesn't want to get deported, and doesn't know that they have rights. And the one that they want to get rid of in the factories is the black worker who's an American who knows that they deserve a, a, a bathroom break every couple hours. And so they pit the workers against each other on purpose. They'll put a, a monolingual English speaker in a, in a factory line with a monolingual Spanish speaker and yell at them to not talk to each other so that the Latino who's maybe been there working a long time can't train the black worker in what to do and the black worker's confused and doesn't understand how the, what his part or her part on the line is and then there are problems so they can get fired easily. Or they put them next to the burning hot ovens um, you know, so that they get exhausted on that job and, 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 the, and the Latino workers get 
you know, d mistreated and they're yelled at a lot and, and, and they're just quietly working, 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 but as soon as uh, someone tries to mistreat a, a black worker, a black worker might speak up for themselves. And the Latino's like, <sighs> you know, you push that person a little more. And so there's a lot of infighting and disagreement amongst the workers on purpose, systematically designed this way so that they will not organize. And so we've been using teatro and Thank you. And um, what's been incredible is that through the process, they're experiencing each other's oppression, and recognizing it, being able to add language to it, and hear each other and realize the same thing is happening to them, that they're not islanded, that, you know, I, I just work, I go to work, I, I, I'm trying to finish my thing and, 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 and go home with a paycheck. But actually that they're treating her that way and him that way and them that way. So our scenes that we create are about their experience. And so you might see a temp agency and um, uh, welcome to the carousel of opportunities temp staffing agency. And you see that the Latino workers told hurry up, uh, they walk inside uh, looking for work, uh, trabajo, trabajo, and they get sent out to the factory and the workers like, um, but where will they go and how much and when do I come back? And they're not giving any details and they just rush, rush out the door. And the black worker walks in and they're like, uh, you know, here's this stack of employment forms you have to fill out. And it's gonna cost you $50 for your background check and $50 for your pee in a cup. And, and, and it comes out of your pocket. And, and you see that scene and, and, the, and, the, and all the Latino workers are getting sent out and the black workers filling out the forms, but, but can I go to that factory? Can I go? I'm dressed in my boots, can I go? And they're not interested in sending that worker out. Yes. So now that was the first <laughs> five. Yes. And now to get to your sp specific, however you want to share that. Five so the, now. So the scene works, uh, the scenes that have been developed have come from their lives. And what's been incredible is to see that the workers are workers, and some of them are actually organizers who are, you know, there's three of them that are part-time organizers for the organization. And the theater of the oppressed tools have really been incredibly supportive to them as organizers, right? Because they're trying to get their comunidad in their neighborhood to come out to the meetings, to do an action for a mom who maybe wasn't paid and uh, has four children and, and needs a, a check, and so we do an action outside of a factory and we invite the press to come. And as we've been performing these things, we've seen both that the workers have been experiencing an incredible amount of collective healing together um, because of the opportunity to speak about the oppressions that are all that trauma that gets stumped down, but also because of the way they're received. So like last year, we were doing a, a scene at the Chicago Women's Foundation, and the audience are professionals, women, men, professionals in Chicago, and they're hearing these scenes for the first time, and Theater of the Oppressed is interactive, so we do a forum theater, and we invite the audience to, to, to stop the scene, the action after they've seen the scene. You see a supervisor firing an older woman because she's too slow on the line. And one of the audience members comes up and offers her intervention is that she replaces the supervisor and fires the woman, but in the kindest and most dignified way. You know, it would, I thank you for your years of work. Uh, we just, we, we, we can no longer have you here. We would, you know, you need to go now. And she does this in a respectful way and the entire audience does what you did. <gasps> and it was an incredible moment of the, for the workers to see middle class Chicago recognize that that was not okay. Recognize that, that f this older woman needs the work, she is working, and she needs that paycheck, and that firing her kindly wasn't helpful. <laughs> and that singular moment like resonated so much in the workers, because we're working with Waukegan workers, and that's the northeast uh, suburb, Chicago South Side, Englewood, Chicago West Side, Latinos in, in, in Little Village. And each one of those has talked about how we need allies on, as the supervisors. We need allies that would, you know, what, what they problem solve was maybe, well, let's switch places with the older lady. You do this part that's easier, I do your part. You know, we, we let's switch places on the line. Let's find other solutions where she doesn't have to lose her job. And the, w and the organizers have been able to take these experiences and, and, and it supports them in their organizing because they've become much more confident uh, facilitating w workshops with different kinds of workers in their neighborhoods. As outreach method, they're, they're getting a larger interest because the, the, when they host a meeting, it's not sit down and write the whole time. It's come, play games, and then 
people are like, how does this have anything to do with my you know, temp work? And then by the end of the workshop, they realize they feel stronger, they're more informed, they've learned a ton. So it's directly affecting their ability to organize. And even for some of the workers where the collective healing has been incredibly supportive, we've also had individuals realize that maybe it isn't too late to learn English and in their 40s and 50s are trying to take s English classes because they feel empowered through image theater where, where they didn't have to talk and they were still leading groups who spoke English and they spoke only Spanish. They realized that they could still lead. So there's just been incredible uh, both individual growth and collective growth from the group and the groups are growing. There used to be just, one, when I first started, there was just one or two people in each site really doing, hammer, ham, you know, hitting the pavement. And now there's groups of five, six, seven, ten. And they've supported workers who've gotten fired en masse. Like 150 people showed up to work one day in Waukegan one and, were left. and were let go. And our workers from all of the sites showed up to Waukegan and we led Theater of the Oppressed workshops to talk about that experience because some of those workers had worked for that factory for 25 years. Some of those workers had only been there two years and they didn't understand that they had rights. So through the theater, they're learning about the laws that protect them as workers and then they're realizing that we can organize. So there's now, those 150 people are organized by a community of 12 representatives and they are fighting the factory with legal support from the organization to pursue, you know, pay. You know, they, they can no longer get those jobs back because ICE has their name and their social security numbers on a list somewhere. But it's been very practical the way the theater has affected the way they meet and what they're doing in their meetings. And, it, and it's just been incredible because we're getting um, invited. And again, these are working moms and dads. So even though we call ourselves the workers resistance theater, they're not professional actors, but you wouldn't be able to tell if you saw them perform. <laughs> Jasmine, <laughs> thank you. Thanks. I want to acknowledge your work. I don't know that I got it all in there, but <laughs> <laughs> And I, I want to note that, like, Jasmine, I think, like, other artists out there, Jasmine doesn't have an institutional home. Jasmine is a freelance artist gigging in Chicago who works at the largest and most well-resourced institutions in Chicago as a performer and as a collaborator and also cobbles together the work as in lots of worker. difference as a temp worker, as a precarious worker in the arts and change economy in Chicago uh, and is super known and respected for that work in the city there as she should be. I also wanna note as we shift over to Mark that, and, and we'll come back and be in conversation, uh, as we shift over to Mark that Jasmine's story is, is about Theater of the oppressed is the tactic that she's using, right? She's talking about Boal work, which is one way that in this country we've thought about theater and activism for a while, uh, and internationally as well, of course. It's not, the, it's not the only way. There's lots of practices, and I think Mark is gonna share some experiences that aren't necessarily theater of the oppressed centered and work he's doing. So do you want the five and five, or do you want a 10? Uh, five and five. All right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hopefully not take the 10, so. so I well, don't believe you. I but, know, I know, I know. Uh, All right, the first five starts. <laughs> hey, y'all. Um, so, uh, so good morning, and um, uh, so, so a, a couple of things. So, uh, in terms of so, so kind of the, the first part about uh, uh, like like what the work is and contextualizing kind of approach, I, I, I've got to be honest. Um, you know, so much uh, of it's a long period of my life where I, I knew I wanted to be in theater, I just didn't know like how. And then uh, I, I met up with Cornerstone Theater Company in Los Angeles, and it was just kind of the world just changed like overnight, and and. Uh, uh, I found a way of working, a, a way to kind of combine so many things that I care about. And so, so a lot of what I do is just really kind of grounded in that practice, just, uh, just where I grew up, just sort of I grew up as an artist, uh, as a human being, you know, you know and, um, uh, and so, so, um, so, so, so th you know, uh, 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 there's that kind of practice. If, if you don't know, Cornerstone uh, is a theater that works in and with uh, communities uh, sometimes adapting uh, uh, classic plays, sometimes creating new plays with uh, members of that community and then performing first time, kind of often first time artists uh, acting alongside professional company members to do plays about their, their home. Uh, and so, so that's a big part of it. And then kind of from there, like other, other things kind of came, uh, came to light. The work of John O'Neill and the Free Southern Theater 
uh, the road of Dudley Cock and Roadside Theater. Uh, you know, I've become familiar with Dr. Campesino and some of that practice. Um, you know, Michael's work is just a, again a, just a big influence. So, so a lot of a lot of I just kind of want to name that that um, you know what I do is just really it, it's, it's part of a tradition. It's part of as part of other work is work that others are doing, and and you know I'm trying to just kind of add to it, but it, it's not mine. Um, so, so there's that. Um, you know, one of the things that you know through a lot of this work for a long time, I, I've been. Um, I've kind of operated under the belief that uh, you can do this play and people will see it and um, and and it'll it'll change something in them. You know, it'll it'll resonate somehow. They'll feel something. They'll think about something. It'll it'll increase empathy and and all these things are good. And and over time, if we can do this often enough, then we can we can make change. And um, I don't really believe that anymore. Like uh, I just I just don't, I don't think a play changes people. I think you can have a really good experience, and I think you'd be deeply moved. Um, but I don't, I don't really think it's, it can boost our empathy that much because my experience of sitting in an audience is like I'm annoyed by the people around me. Like the guy next to me is like has his elbow on the armrest, is man spreading, and I can't move, and I have to crawl over people, and they're just annoying. Like I don't, I'd much rather not have them there. Uh, so, so the shared experience of we're going to breathe air together, I can, like. Don't need it. Like, um, yeah, and so so um, so so then what? Then then, then they, they, so then why do this? Like, what's the point? Like, you know, it's so like like total existential crisis. Uh, and then and then what I realized it's something that that often happened in, in work that I when I was at Cornerstone. You tell people people would ask like, how's the play going? And you'd start to share the stories. And, uh, and almost always somebody says, well, I wish you could tell that story. I wish more people knew about like, what's happening in the rehearsal room. And, and I've come to the realization that I don't think the, the output is the thing that changes people. I think the process is the thing that changes people. And I know, I've seen over and over again, going through the process of making, going through what we do to, to create, to kind of imagine, to rehearse, that is meaningful. Like that, you know, when, when you have to work with somebody who is not like you, who has different ideas, either as simple as like, I think I should go this to this side of the stage instead of that side, or like deep philosophical things, you know, where like, I don't want to work with a gay person. I don't want to work with an African-American. Latinos should not be here, you know. Uh, um, and so, how do you how do you find a way to stick together to find kind of a, a, a collective meeting? How do you find ways to just kind of bridge those gaps? And uh, and I think when you do that, all in the in the process of making something, hopefully something that is good, something that you have ownership of, um, you share that. You know, you you and uh, you know some of the things that you know, like in, in like how do you know that this makes a difference? You know, you see things like. People start to give each other kind of rides to and from rehearsals because everybody's got jobs, right? So how do we know it works? Like they're spending time together in a car. They're giving each other rides. How do we know this works? People, they, they start to bring food. It's like, hey, I brought some food for all of us to share. And you start to see these sorts of things, that these indications that relationships are getting built, right? These indications that, that, um, that they're friends. That's five. And your second five. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, so, so with that as kind of the 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 kind of the the, the kind of foundation, right? So, so, if it's not if it's not um, if it's not the play, then how do you then, then then how do you start to make process the thing? So I'm, I'm just starting work on a project. Um, um, I, I want it with the intent of policy change. Like this is very much about changing housing policy. So, so I, uh, I, I have the fortune of being able to visit a lot of different cities and everywhere, seriously, every single one, I drive by, walk by a homeless encampment. Like in every city, this is not like just giant cities, this is suburbs, like these are, you're seeing it everywhere. And, um, and so, so I'm creating this new piece that, uh, that really wants to, that, that his purpose is to shift housing policies in, uh, we're going to start with five cities, um, Minneapolis, Cincinnati, um, Syracuse, New York, 
uh, a, a city in Los Angeles uh, uh, County, a small one, uh, and then the fifth city that we haven't identified, uh, maybe Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, so that, that, that's, that's a possibility. And, and what we want to do is we're working with a whole bunch of partners, like a lot of people, national organizations, uh, the Local Initiative Support Corporation, LISC, um, the uh, uh, New Hab Network, the Network of Energy Housing and Building, which is an environmental housing organization of environmentalist housing uh, groups. Um, Americans for the Arts uh, uh, is helping with uh, uh, government uh, advocacy lobbying. Uh, through New Hab, there's a lot of policy wants there. And then uh, working locally in each place with um, the city, kind of city government representatives, uh, community development folks, uh, advocacy groups. And um, there's two parts to it. So we're creating this play, this performance called Exiled in America. And, um, and Exiled will be performed, like there's always an art partner in all of these. So it will get presented, produced at a local presenting house or theater. And then there's a process by which all of these constituencies that I've just identified meet regularly, all under the guise of help us make a play. Because oftentimes what we found is people uh, have grown tired of talking to each other or they just aren't talking to each other to begin with. So we can just become outsiders, nucleus that just brings, that just kind of can draw folks together. And then we want to create a process, like, like I talked about like with the Cornerstone thing, of like how do we just start to make something together? And through that, how can we start to imagine what better housing policy is? And because we're dealing with plays, we can leave behind the realities of their day to day. Like I, I get that there's, there's any number of landmines here, but, but we're making a play so we can set whatever rules that we want to make. And, um, and so, so we can just kind of start to put that aside and hopefully start to imagine collectively what, what we want. And if we can imagine it, if we can see it, I believe we can kind of make our way there. And, and if we can create a process by which we're enacting it, then we stand a better chance. And so, um, so, so that, that is kind of uh, what it looks like in practice, uh, uh, all of these things. You have one minute, so I'm going to ask you a okay. question. Is that okay? See, I did 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, you were right and I was wrong. I was just <laughs> so uh, I want to ask you, um, you're talking very specifically about a, a desired policy impact. Yeah. And the work I hear you talking about that feels important to, to make really visible is the process that you have developed as an artist over the years of bringing stakeholders together who have different agendas uh, and finding a collective vision, which is what a director does in a rehearsal room, right? So you are sort of bringing that to organizing a coalition of different players necessary for policy movement in a community on an issue like homelessness. So in the, in the minute that you have, maybe if you could share one thought about like when you get that group of different players together, how does your theater artist self, your director creator self, use your organizing experience in the rehearsal room to help them imagine collectively what's possible? They're not self-defined as actors. They're not self-defined as artists. So how do you use that imaginative, collaborative expertise to get those folks to think about policy and coalition building? You know, it's through, uh, so, so uh, uh, you know, this, you know, I mentioned Roadside and, and Junebug as kind of, uh, um, kind of examples. So, so story circle process is kind of one way of like, let's just start there. Let's just, just start by just talking to one another. And so how do you start to just like, a build trust. I think uh, uh, Maria or, or Stephanie yesterday in their emergent, uh, quoting from the, the, the day before, would say that, emergent, yes. Emergent strategy. Yeah, yeah. Um, that it, you move at the speed of trust. Mm -hmm. you know, so how do you start to build trust? So, so part of that is just like, let's just start by just kind of like start there. And then from there, we can, we can create a series of prompts uh, uh, or a series of exercises of let's make this. So, so let's kind of divide into groups and have different representatives. And uh, what does what what does like like draw or make or sculpt or create a composition about uh, uh, around what um, what the right policy is, what it looks like when it works, uh, uh, so so that we can just kind of sidestep that and uh, and just get to the imagining, uh, sidestep the, the realities uh, uh, and just get to the imagining of what they would like to see, and then and through that you kind of start moment. to to build. Thank you. Yeah. I, I want to acknowledge that like a lot of us in this room and some more than others have experienced, I mean, I'm Annie Hamburger there, we found an on-guard arts. I mean, it's probably hard to find someone with more expertise 
at building unlikely partnerships to make large, ambitious things happen. Like you have done that, I believe, for a while. And a lot of people who produce in non-traditional contexts and spaces have that set of skills that we're sorely lacking in civic and political discourse in this country S and in community development spaces very often. So I just want to think about Melanie Joseph at the Foundry, particularly the last five to 10 years and sort of her work there at bringing people together. So that kind of coalition building is um, one of the kind of organizing things we're talking about here aimed at policy change. Uh, so I'm gonna do, I'll do my five now. Um, so Sojourn Theater is, is, is my artistic family, uh, just about 20 years now, where I make work, and I also make work as a theater maker, but the Center for Performance and Civic Practice is a space where five of us spun off of Sojourn to start this center about seven years ago because we were getting asked to help build capacity in other spaces for other people doing art and change work, and the theater didn't have the capacity to do it. It was starting to tap us out, just in terms of the hours in the day. So we started this center because we felt in the field this movement. Uh, it, the work wasn't new, but it was sort of growing and people were looking for support at arts institutions, theaters, but also at arts councils and legislative bodies and health departments and policy groups. So CPCP, our center, started focusing on how do we use our organizing, imaginative, and collaborative skills to make things happen as theater artists in spaces that are not theater and performance spaces. So I mean, this is new, so the narrative I'm about to share, I'm still figuring out how to tell. We have different uh, programs and initiatives. We fund uh, projects around the country, individual artists working with community partners. We work with arts agencies, we work with community development organizations and help them think about how to receive partnership with artists, designers, culture makers, and heritage holders. We got reached out to a few months ago by the state of Kansas. It was the uh, Department of Commerce, the State Department, and the Arts Commission, which was defunded a few years ago in Kansas and is now coming back as a program of the Department of Commerce. And I'm gonna try to tell a sort of complicated story in a ridiculously short amount of time, but to me it's, it's the example that I'm very excited about right now. Uh, Trump's government, the presidency, the federal government, and the Republican-led Congress have something called opportunity zones that they've been pushing as an economic development tool in the past few years in particular. And uh, the Democrats have been pretty concerned, as of many people, because in particular what it does is it lines up the potential for tax subsidies uh, and economic support for business interests in communities all over the country, and it sort of bypasses residents who live in places. And community organizers and community development folks have been uh, raising the flags and, and sort of chiming the, the sirens about this. And there are some folks doing specific work where they are attempting to hold accountable at the state level the opportunity zone proposals that a state government puts forward to the federal government, because that's how it works. A state can put forward counties or regions with proposals for things that will aid that community's development. But again, what it is in many places around the country right now is business interests and developers who know how to operate those levers sort of saying, yes, here's a great opportunity for us. It's a blighted area. We're gonna buy up land, help us, and in five years, there'll have been displacement, and then we can make a mint on it. That's what's happening in a lot of spaces. So uh, led by Congresswoman Sewell from Alabama, uh, she's done an incredible job of helping make clear that states can actually regulate how those things have to go through a process of accountability to get to the proposal to the federal government. All this to say, a couple people at the state of Kansas are really committed to figuring out how residents can drive this process. And they invited us to help them design a process to bring state leaders, legislators, business leaders, community development organizers together and basically brainstorm on an approach so that the state would put forward proposals absolutely in service to resonant desires and aspirations and needs. So I went a couple weeks ago and I led a day workshop for 50 leaders from around the state of Kansas. Uh, legislators, business folks, civic folks, and the goal of the day was to agree publicly in front of the state's secretary of state, who was there for the day, and who acknowledged at the end it was the first time in his two years in office that he has attended any public event outside the Capitol for more than an hour and a half. And he stayed the whole day. And the reason was these were folks that he's sort of accountable to in a lot of ways. He's an elected official. And we were 
working, 45 seconds. No, of course, thank you. We were working to come up with um, a set of values and intentions that this group could agree on in front of the Secretary of State and then commit state funding to an engagement design for the following year to help make sure resident voices directed the proposals that go to the state government that then goes to the federal government. And the day went, it was a theater-based day. There was storytelling, there was improvisation, there was facilitation, and it, it was the stuff I know how to do as a director and a maker in that room with those folks. And as a result of that day, we're now helping them design a set of strategies for the 35 counties in Kansas where there'll be resident engagement in each county led by a resident who's becoming a champion advocate for that county. And we're using theater to sort of organize that process across the 35 counties. And, and it's very exciting, but it could really fail because there's a lot of layers that has to go through for what comes out of the grassroots work to actually be heard and moved forward. But we're trying to set practices of accountability based in ensemble at every level of the process. So that's the kind of work that, that I'm really, like I love being in a rehearsal room. Sorry, I'm 30 seconds over. I love being in a rehearsal room, but I had as much fun in that room with those 50 folks in Kansas as I do in any space I'm in with my company because purpose and creative practice felt very aligned that day. And our core values of racial and economic justice, which we bring into the room actively and vocally and are trying to work on in terms of resident engagement, are sort of at play in a way that hopefully feels like they can have a little bit of impact. So that's, that's my example of sort of this deploying process outside of the rehearsal room towards purpose and impact. Um, thanks for my extra seconds. I apologize. Uh, so, what we want to do, we, you know, we've, we, we have 16 minutes, um, and we want to acknowledge that, that there's a lot of people in this room who probably have uh, your own practices that relate to what we're describing. And so we either want to make space for like a, a question for any of us to respond to, or for someone to say, here's a way I'm thinking or working on this. But, because we have, for the most part, been... Uh, orthodox to this, we're going to do the same thing so somebody who is excited does not take the next seven minutes. So anybody who wants to ask or offer, I'm going to sort of give you 60 seconds and he can start uh, and then at the end of the 60 seconds I'm going to with love and respect say we're going to keep going. Does that, does that sound okay? Okay, so Annie, the mic's coming over to you. Here it comes. And I'll start that clock and thanks for giving us the starting time. So I have a statement, um, an idea, and a question. Is that okay? You have 60 okay. seconds. So anyway, nothing, Amber. as you know, nothing worth doing is without risk and the potential for failure. So you're here that you're doing that. The idea is, I've always thought that um, one should work with like the EDC and get an empty parking lot and then invite all the homeless people into tents that you set up and then do performances in the tents. And it was all legal because you've rented empty parking lots. So I give that to you if that's at all useful. And then the third thing is, I have to admit um, that in the, in the past couple of shows I've done that have toured the country based Arc Live and Wilderness, I've done post-performance panel conversations. And I'm starting to question the validity of that as a tool to reach out to the audience. I think we're all getting a little overloaded on post-performance panel discussions, and I raise my hand as being guilty. So um, the question, and with all these brilliant people in the audience, I would love to hear what, it's what you said, what, what are people's ideas? If, you, if you're not giving up on shows, right? <laughs> what are people's ideas for how one can enrich, envelop, and expand a community experience around the show? That's a new idea. I imagine many people in here can respond. I have thoughts, but I want to start with the two of you if you have thoughts that you want to respond to that with. Um, what we've been doing is that if we get invited to do a one hour show, we actually only do a 15 or 20 minute show with people participating at the uh, for the last five to 10 to 15 minutes of the first section. And the majority of the time, the 45 minutes or 40 is spent in the work. So using uh, games activities to 
in, to in, involve the entire audience in a giant ass circle if necessary, out in the grass or in the gymnasium that we're in. We specifically don't ask to be in theaters like this so that we can be physically engaged with the audience because our, uh, we're focusing on trying to perform with and for workers so they learn about their rights and they can, they can use those r real expertise experiences to create images and to share, share uh, traumas that are, that, are, that are shared, right? They're shared experiences, whether they got fired unnecessarily or someone touched them. Like there's, there are, everyone has experienced this oftentimes in our audiences. So, so, so if we're working in a community that's worker-based, instead of having a discussion about it, we're doing it with them. And that's the way we've been growing the collective because people keep coming back. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's a, that's such a great question. Something I'm thinking about a whole lot. Like so for this piece, um, you know, we've got a process for the key stakeholders, those most affected. But there is a performance piece, and so how do you give the audience that opportunity as well? That isn't just talking because everything you said. But but how do you? And and it also just doesn't put people on the spot because I you know like it's also could be really uncomfortable. So so my I mean here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to call Michael Road. Because like he's like the master of it, like like he's so good at building in this this opportunity, these ways of building participation into the art in an artful way. Because I feel that's the key: is that it has to have aesthetic, it has to have an aesthetic rigor, and be part of the art. I, I want to go beyond just like not turn to your neighbor. Like Jeff Sabell is somebody is another person who's just a genius at it, you know. So like turning to these people who are like the best is. We can, we can get on the conference call. <laughs> um, thank you for the kind words. Uh, I, I want to say that I think for me the starting place for thinking about that is actually that we, whoever are making or shaping the event, need to answer up front what the purpose is we have in mind. I find that there are three common purposes that folks bring to trying to answer the question you just asked, and I find very often speaking about lying that folks including myself sometimes, like self-lie a little bit about what the purpose actually is. And I find they kind of fall into three buckets. Purpose one is uh, I want a chance to be affirmed in how powerful an experience this was for the audience and hence we're gonna stay and talk about it. Purpose two is I want people to have the chance to deepen their interaction internally and reflectively with the content and experience and I wanna make a way for that to happen for people with different learning and receiving styles. And purpose three is there is a very specific impact or uh, change practice that we uh, aspire to, that this event is impulsed by, and we want to make way for these folks to participate in that movement for change. And often people kind of say it's the third, but it's kind of the first or second, um, which is very human, and, and it's not like that's a bad, but that happens a lot. And if it's really the third one, then I think you either have to build it into the dramaturgy of the event in a way that makes the motor of that change aspiration be as important as anything else that's relevant to your aesthetic choices, or you have to determine, uh, okay, whatever your philosophy for change is, whether it's communities of practice, or organizing principles, or radical change, you then have to make space, circles, uh, visiting folks who actually are connected to those issues and change, opportunities for folks to connect. Is it dialogue? Is it an action that leaves the theater as the event ends? You just have to decide, like, what's your theory of change in relation to your content, and what's the degree that you wanna foreground those moments to be even more important than whatever was just shared or to be a part of what was just shared. So I think like starting with answering those questions and then you know one can be really generative about the strategies for the specific event, but I think you have to answer those questions first. So other, Anthony, because I'm really excited because Anthony is at this convening and he is a, a lawyer and a professor of law at Georgetown University who brings students at Georgetown into community development circles, so I, I don't care what you say, I'm so happy you're here. <laughs> and now I'm really interested in what you say, actually. So. Well, look, th this is phenomenal. Um, you guys are doing great, transformative, disruptive work, and uh, oh my God, I'm so appreciative of the fact that you are in this space doing what you do. I feel so alive by just listening to you and engaging you a bit. Um, as Michael said, I do uh, community development work, uh, law professor, lawyer, and um, I serve as a kind of developer. I build affordable housing communities that are about being more than places where people kind of live, eat, sleep, go to work, and repeat. 
we're trying to create um, you know, a community that's synergetic, that is a place where people can collaborate around complex issues that, that, that underserved communities are facing because those problems are kind of like playing a game of whack-a-mole. You know? It's like you try to deal with one part of the problem, something else pops up, something else pops up, right? And so oftentimes you need kind of hybrid, moving parts, complex solutions to deal with the complex problems that people face. And, 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 and trying to provide a space where people feel as though they can step into ownership and agency in being partners uh, working together to deal with those problems over the long run is a gap that we now have in our public-private partnerships where neither sector is really incentivized for the long-term you know, uh, play and commitment that's needed to deal with these problems. And so I think that we need kind of social sector actors and organizations that can provide that kind of long-term social impact work. Here's the question I, I have for you. Um, the process is extraordinarily important. The journey is often much more important than the, the, the designation, right? Um, how do you, within the process, however, create this kind of synergetic, reiterative approach in which the people who are part of the process become leaders of a process that continues without your having to be the intervener to orchestrate and direct the process, right? Mm -hmm. How do you assure that there is a kind of centrifugal force that emanates from your intervention that lives on beyond your particular intervention? Can I Please do. I just want to say thank you for that great question. So last year I was really fortunate to be a catalyst initiative receiver of CPCP's work, and I'm doing this work pretty voluntarily. And just to have a small grant allowed me to have more focus time uh, to, because I said I am a precarious worker. I piece together my paycheck from many jobs or volunteer things that someone generously decides to help me out a little bit. And that focus allowed me to do train the trainer sessions where, where I said to Chicago Workers Collaborative, let's do one monthly where instead of me, I, I'm still going to the separate sites, but specifically where all of the sites come together and we have one session a month where Sh uh, Inglewood is together with La Villita, is together with Waukegan, and we have four hours minimum together. And I, so I wanna teach them this technique because I go and do it there, I go and do it there, I go and do it there, but as a result of that, that's where I saw real change happen in their leadership of it, whereas they thought it was fun and interesting and cool up until that point, and then they realized that I was teaching process, the why we're doing this, what uh, kind of setup would require this game versus that game, how they're scaffolded and what the outcome could be if we do this direction versus that direction. And only because I did that process of, of training the trainer, like really thinking about it that my, you know, creating, um, you know, ex uh, handouts that were bilingual, even though my Spanish is atrocious because I never, I'm illiterate in Espanol. I can speak it, but I don't write it well. But they're so generous and loving, they took it anyways and use it. <laughs> and it's like, and it's, so I feel like that's been an important part of it. And also when we get an invitation that I'm not available to, I, s I, I, I help them and support them. And, and we decide how the experience is gonna go and who's gonna do which part of the session or that visit so that they feel super prepped because they don't have a theater degree. They didn't take practicum hours to be a, a teaching artist out there in the world. And I realize it's my job to make sure that I don't send them out there to sink. I want them to succeed, and, and they are very successful without me. I just am giving them another tool that, that goes along with all these other organizing things. So, so that, that, you know, what you had asked about panel discussions, like we still will do the organizing component of saying this Illinois senator is placing this um, bill up for legislative, you know, to support workers' rights in this way. Would you sign this petition before you go home? You know, we're still adding these very active organizing elements to the experience for the public, um, as well as physically doing it themselves. Uh, uh, I, I find that people are really nice, and people are, are typically kind. Uh, and so, so uh, and, and trying to just, like there's two big challenges. One is just getting them into the room to begin with. And I feel pretty good about that, because like, my strategy there is like, we're making this play, they respond, I'm not an actor, I don't like theater, I've never done it, 
and I was like, great, but you know, like you are an expert in this, and I don't want to go out and make something that's going to make me look like an idiot and make more problems. So I need you, and and folks are usually kind enough to show up, and they'll show up once, and then the hard part is how do you get them back? And so to your to your question about leadership, right? Like like how do you get them to like own it? You know, it, it, it's you let them lead, like you let them be experts at the thing that they're expert at. And, uh, uh, and, and you know, like, like there's two parts, like one is, you know, you talked about like we are artists, we're directors. Part of it is like there's this, there's a, there's a dance that you make, like you have to, you have to create enough structure, you know, which means like you're, you're constantly leading and yet you also have to know when to like let that kind of loosen your grip on that. <laughs> And let and let folks kind of take the way and just it's the and just follow right you know but but it's always I think you know here's where like it's it's what we do as artists and it's the skills that we bring as artists and so I feel like art makers are are like that that's that's our expertise that's the expertise I bring in. This is first of all you're the kindest man in the world so when you ask people to come and they look <laughs> in your face you're just like all right. <laughs> He can do that. I start to cry. <laughs> it's true. Bad it's true. He will. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, just on this notion of centrifugal force, which is actually a really beautiful way to, to put it. And Professor Goldman is walking down, so I know we're in our final moment. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you. Can someone please take a picture from up there that would text her or something to me? Because this girl from Chicago is on a, at a Georgetown event speaking, and that's so crazy. <laughs> Keep going. I have to show my mom. Someone should, yeah, well, the other angle of that is Georgetown is pretty freaking lucky that you're here. That's the deal. <laughs> you know, that's the actual deal. Um, but just in relation to what you said, uh, we think a lot about capacity building and uh, to get super micro about it, there's the capacity building we do with the folks that we work with, right? Like trying to pass on leadership and momentum. But there's also, like, I feel like, the most powerful um, moment, I think, for me that happened in Kansas at the end of that day was, and it was kind of an accident because I realized that everyone in the room, they kind of knew I was an artist, but they thought I was like a professional facilitator or whatever, um, which, I don't know, maybe, but what I said to them at the end was, I need you all to, to understand that I'm here in the space today, not because I'm a trained like facilitator, I'm here because I'm an artist. And because I have skills that I have deployed today, and every one of you, there are artists in your communities who you only think of in terms of their creative output or their ability to contribute to the economic development of your community, the mural, the small organization, whatever. You need to realize that the kind of it process that we're experiencing today that I happen to be guiding us through today, you have artists in your communities who can lead process and work with you in ways that are different than you think. And to me, that's the centrifugal force. That's the movement that we're all sort of a part of, which is how are we making more visible the contributions artists, designers, culture makers, and heritage holders can make beyond the output that we are accustomed to them contributing to their communities. And that means we're helping build their capacity, the artists and designers, culture makers, and heritage holders, and we're helping those who don't think to reach out to them to reach out to them and be prepared to collaborate with them. And we're helping the funders and the higher ed context validate those kind of collaborations as not just marginal sort of art, but as a part of the heart of practice that creators can offer everywhere. So that to me is like part of the centrifugal force that we're trying to establish in addition to passing on skills. You know. I would add, um, there are aesthetic qualities to all of this. Like it is art with its own aesthetics. And, and that's another conversation that I, I just want to always just keep on the, on the front burner so that we can understand it as art making. Yeah. Uh, well, if we do another question, we're gonna go beyond our three or four minutes. Emma, do you want to put a question out? We'll let it hang in the air and that'll be our final question. Oh no, it's not Please and maybe I'll talk to you about it, Jessica and Mark. I think it's more specifically um, for those working as freelancers and, and independent practitioners. And it relates to everything you were just saying as well, Michael. But I just would be curious to discuss with you how you think about capacity, logistics, fundraising, partnership building, and things like that when you do not have sustained organizational support. Um, and we don't have time for that now, but I would love to have a conversation with you about that. Can I actually, that actually raises a question we talked about. Mm -hmm. How many people in this room 
uh, have a home-based job in an institution, whatever that means to you. Arts organization, university, not-for-profit, whatever it is. Just curious. Awesome, and, and many people don't, but just thinking about like a lot of the folks leading this work on the ground would not have their hands up for that one. And so what, what is the precariousness of the movement that we're talking about supporting and building? How can institutions support those workers in humane and ethical ways? How do we create humane and ethical partnerships? And I would say, if you are at an institution, find those local artists doing it, because I'm dealing with hungry people, and I don't know how to feed them. And I'm dealing with people that are almost homeless who I've brought to my home because yeah. like, I don't have a social service agency that will give them a shelter experience yeah. for a night or two. And I'm not letting a single mom with her kids on the street. But like my husband's like, babe. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so, so it's like, yeah. you know, find the artists and help them because I don't understand institutions but would yeah. really like to because yeah. I understand that there is money. I just don't act, know how to access it quite yet. Kathy said, everything we need is in the room, an old organizer. And that is almost the beginning of a next conversation. Right. You know, so let's stop on that. And thank Woo! you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, thank you Jasmine, Mark, Michael. Amazing. We're going to um, take like the, a two-minute sort of stay in your places as a few more people come in and as they set up the space for this next short performance. And then we have a, a kind of, uh, we're not having the tent today, as some of you heard already. We have lunch in the building and a shorter lunch break with lots of like handheld op options, box lunches, bagels, so you can hopefully get your lunch at, you know, mill and get it on that break or throughout the early afternoon. Um, come on in. Um, uh, another moment of introducing someone who I, uh, who I <laughs> know very, very uh, deeply and well. Um, um, come on down. Um, Kathy Randall's yesterday very um, sweetly invoked the, my earlier uh, earlier years um, of collaboration with her and the founding of a theater company uh, that that I was part of founding called Street Signs in Chicago, which Rage Within Without, Kathy's piece was one of the first pieces we produced. It, um, and um, that theater company I, we had in Chicago it, in, in the 1990s till 1999, and it moved with me to Chapel Hill, North Carolina in 1999, um, where I got to find and work with the extraordinary Della Pollock, who's here, who changed my life. Um, in every way. And um, one of the things that happened a couple of years into being there is I got a call from another Northwestern grad who I had not known before um, that he was in North Carolina as well and wanted to meet, um, and we did. And um, that also uh, completely changed my life. He, we started to work together. He directed an extraordinary production of Jim Grimsley's Dream Boy, uh, Joe Clarko, Shakespeare's r and a number of other projects in uh, North Carolina for street signs. And then when I came to Georgetown, he, um, with his wife Elizabeth Corley, assumed the leadership of street signs. So it's actually been one of the most moving parts of my personal professional trajectory to sort of have this little company we founded in Chicago be um, under the auspices of, um, of Joseph. Um, I learned so, so much from Joseph about um, performance and particularly the craft of shaping and directing solo performance and developing new work and working with an individual voice. Um, he's extraordinary at it. He, has, he runs the Process Series, has run it for a decade or so in North Carolina. He's an artist in residence at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, he is the artistic director of the Street Science Center for Literature and Performance, which feels good to say, having founded it 20, some 26, 27 years ago. And he introduced me to the extraordinary artist, Kane Smigo, who you're going to um, see a piece of his work today. I met Kane. I think Ari's in the room with Ari uh, Roth. Uh, um, uh, he came and did a section of his work, and we were completely uh, 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 set on fire by it. So excited to share some of that with you. I'm going to hand this over to Joseph Meagle. Uh, 
um, it's always good to be in the room with Derek because we're often uh, mistaken for the same person. <laughs> but, and, and literally, I'm his older, dimmer twin. But, um, um, and it's, it's good to be here. And um, one of the things, you just take a moment to breathe. Between each of these moments, it feels to me that we all need to meditate a little bit. Um, I'm so pleased and honored to have been working with some really beautiful artists. Uh, and I discovered Kane at UNC. He's an alumnus there where he started Spoken Word. Now he's an international spoken word artist uh, performing all around the world. Um, and the work is stunning. Um, I worked with him on a project. He came back with three other artists from the Middle East around uh, the Arab Spring. Uh, and we did a piece called Poetic Portraits of a Revolution, which we helped Kane's uh, stage. And then we took that forward, and in the process series, he brought me Temples of Lung and Air, a hip-hop odyssey of race and identity. Um, and uh, I, fell in, I fell in love with the piece, and we started working on it there. We premiered it at Playmakers in August at, in the PRC Squared, part of their series. And we're going to be doing it in the United Solo Festival in October in New York and at um, Detroit Public Theater in November. So you're going to see just li a few scenes today from it. And uh, uh, I think it will be a, a salve and a way of moving forward throughout the rest of the day. Uh, so here it is, Temples of Lung and Air and Kane Smigo. How's everybody doing? You good? You having a good week? Nice. I was lucky enough to be in town during another program that I run with uh, global hip hop artists who are visiting from seven countries. And uh, it's just, they were here, yeah. Some of you might have come to downstairs. We had a little mini performance. They killed it. Um, but you know, we all have our different ways of connecting with the world. For me, it's, it's been hip hop since I was a kid. Um, I can remember the first uh, album that I ever got was on cassette tape, you know, because I'm from the 90s, which meant you had to fast forward through all the whack songs. And uh, it was by this group called Criss Cross, which were, at that time, they were the big kids for me, but for most of us, they were the little kids, right? Uh, they were these 13 and 14 year old rappers from Atlanta, produced by Jermaine Dupri. And uh, I got their cassette tape when I was seven years old as a gift from my mom. And I think I wore my jeans and jacket backwards for like half a day, <laughs> you know, on a Saturday in the safety of my own home, um, and quickly realized that it was, you know, really hard to walk. It looked ridiculous, and it was probably never going to be a thing. Um, so that was my first experience with hip hop. And my mom's partner for my whole childhood, a man who was kind of a second father figure to me, Burley, used to always say that hip hop is nothing new, rap is nothing new. It's the same thing that the last poets and the Watts Prophets and Gil Scott Heron and Sonia Sanchez and Amiri Brock and a whole bunch of other people I never heard of did back in the 50s and 60s. And of course he was right. Um, I just didn't know it at the time. But hip hop in the modern sense as we understand it first came about in the late 70s, early 80s. And in the beginning, there were two main figures in hip hop, right, that were really important. The MC and the DJ. In the very beginning, the DJ was actually the star of the show. The master of ceremonies, what we now call a rapper, was just a hype man, right? The person saying, make some noise for DJ so-and-so. There's a owner of a Toyota Corolla outside, your lights are on. That was the MC. Um, but soon as MC started rhyming their speech, sliding in some clever wordplay, suddenly the spotlight shifted from the fingers behind the turntable to the mouth behind the microphone. But DJs kept up too, through innovation. With two turntables instead of one, they could load in new records and switch between two records with a crossfader, and the music never stopped. And with good timing, the crossfader could move back and forth between the record on the left and the record on the right, kind of blending them in different ways, like <laughs>
Now I've kind of grown up between songs, between left and right. My mother in Burley in North Carolina during the year and my dad, brother, and grandparents on vacation. They all live together up in West Virginia. Now grandma is a hefty woman. Every recipe gets a stick of butter and she loves feeding people. Her claim to fame is cookies every Christmas. I remember one year she made 3,000 cookies. No lie. She'll sit at the dining room table, patient as a watchmaker, learning the secrets of time until 30 metal tins gather like pyramid stone on the kitchen counter, each guarding a different flavor of sweet. They're rum balls that my brother likes to pop out a handful and try to get tipsy. <laughs> Peanut blossoms, German chocolate, and ice cream that have no ice or cream, but Grandma swears they melt in your mouth. And they do. And, uh, and her version of gingerbread that she calls honey cookies, cut into the shapes of Christmas characters, you know, little red candy balls make uh, Rudolph's nose and Frosty's buttons. And every year, among sheet trays of sugared snowmen and ice reindeer with limbs spread wide as Chippendale dancers in their closing pose <laughs> are the gingerbread men with penises <laughs> and little red candy BBs bright enough to guide a sleigh through a blizzard. This is not a metaphor. They're my grandfather's creations, his tiny, anatomically speaking, contribution to the season's good tidings. Now, Grandma is the one who's kind of mischievous. She's the one always kidding around, throwing in a dirty joke here and there. Grandpa is Catholic, quiet, pretty serious. He's a World War II vet, and my dad says it took him decades before he spoke a word about it, even to his own kids. He lost his best friend, Tex, and probably some of his humanity. But the balls on the gingerbread man are like the cracks in his grumpy old man dogma. Like horseplay in the barracks from the purple-hearted boy he somehow managed to smuggle out of war. Jokes told over a breakfast of sea rations the last morning he saw his best friend alive and the sweet smell of grandma's perfume on nights he awoke in silent fever and realized her body was too warm to be a foxhole. He's got a wisp of a dozen hairs left on the top of his head that I like to style into a point and put the Dairy Queen soft serve twist on the end. He wears Walmart jeans jacked up past the belly button and dons racism like a hand-me-down that was once called fashion. Burley, my mom, eat when I'm four. He's got a master's in African-American history and political science. He'd been an activist in the 70s and 80s and a professor at a college in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Grandma and Grandpa call him Barley when I see them. My father chuckles, says, your mother sure does love chocolate. My brother flicks a Confederate flag Zippo lighter he got from a friend at school. So I see the stars and bars light up my neighbor's window in mom's apartment building back home. Burley's face becomes a silent war as he explains the origin. Thirteen stars on the flag look a lot like thirteen clansmen doing jumping jacks. White freckles on the cheeks of the devil and he's grinning. White rebel fleet rights quite legibly. Black elegy squeezed from the metal. Don't tell me it's the symbol of our pride in the South. Serpal, serpal, set, serpal, serpal. Some people try to say Cain. It's a symbol of Southern pride, but the truth is it was created to promote white supremacy by a government that fought to ensure that black people, everybody, blacks, everybody, the blacks don't know how to talk right, Cain, and you know, most of them are flunkies who don't care for their kids. They're not fathers. Everybody, not fathers. Irrip. The man who was not my father, teaching me to play chess. I teach my homeboy Sergio across the street, and my Sega Genesis collects dust while our queens catfight on the stoop. Grandma says Halle Berry is a pretty black woman. Grandpa asks how Barley's doing, smiling as he says the name. My father says, your mother sure does love chocolate. In first grade, Burley, my mom, sent me careening over pine cones and grass, and my bike becomes my spaceship. My teacher that year is Mrs. McKnight. She's black. We learned basic arithmetic in February study, Dr. King and Rosa Parks. Grandma says, Whoopi Goldberg is uglier than sin. Grandpa tells war stories, claims, you know, uh, the blacks were scaredy cats. I argue with them until my tears chin strap. My father scolds them both for being racist, but then asks how... Barley's doing. In third grade, Burley takes me to see Jet Li and Jackie Chan on the big screen at a kung fu film festival, and 10,000 imaginary bad guys die of roundhouse kicks in my living room. We learn our times tables that year, read our first novels, write short essays. Grandpa says black folks can't speak proper English. Grandma calls Brazil nuts with the word, calls them toes. Dad says chocolate. Now fourth grade is North Carolina history. Tar Heels, tobacco auctions, and the Appalachian Mountains. We learned that slavery was here, but it ended, they tell us. You know, Grandpa says Thomas Jefferson treated his slaves like family. The Cardinals, the State Bird, the Dogwood State Tree, and Flower, Jim Hunt as governor. We learned that segregation was here, but it ended too. You know, racism was here, but now black folks can be anything they want. 
Grandma says they shouldn't be married to white folks, though. I asked Burley and my mom, why aren't you married? They tell me a piece of paper doesn't make their love more real. Burley puts me to bed, rubs my back until I fall asleep. In the summer, my father puts me to bed, rubs my back until I slip into a memory. The first time I hear someone call the N-word is kindergarten. I'm six. A black neighbor two years younger named Isaiah joins us to play when an older white kid named Jonathan calls him the word. His smile opening slow and silent as the flame of a blowtorch in a house of wax. I watch tears melt from Isaiah's four-year-old eyes. And my cousin, she's like the only teenager on the scene, chases Jonathan until he escapes into a drain pipe like some deleted scene from Stand By Me. <laughs> Looking back, I know he was just a parakeet in Jim Crow's living room. I mean, we all parakeets of one doctrine or another. I was a songbird caught between anthems, between left and right, or far left and far right. The music in my head getting louder, Burley's voice and my grandparents jumbled like a rookie DJ fumbling with the crossfader. Rap, rap, Reagan, Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan was a wonderful president. R wonderful, rap, rap, Reagan, Ronald, Ronald was a right-wing demagogue, a fanatic. R Reagan, right, 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 right wing fanatic president. R a wonderful fanatic, natic, 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 you know. In the morning, good morning in the morning. In the morning, this is National Public Radio. You bet it morning. Welcome to the Rush Limbaugh Show in the morning. Black leaders met today in the morning. Black leaders met in the morning. Let me put it to you this way. The NFL all too often looks like a game between the Bloods and the Crips without any weapons. There I said it in the morning. Black leaders in the morning. A game between Bloods and Crips without any weapons. The morning. Black leaders. The morning. Bloods and Crips without any weapons. The morning. Blood without any weapons. The morning. Black leaders. Morning. Blood without any weapons. Black leaders. Morning. Black leaders. Morning. Black leaders. Morning. Blood without any weapons. Are you confused? I was too. So in fourth grade, Burley comes in my class to speak. He teaches about something other than tar heels and tobacco auctions. When he enters, a room full of crayons drop. A kid digging up his nose freezes mid-nostril as puzzled eyes ping pong between us. It's like Bart Simpson turning in his homework, Baby Bop cussing out, you know, Barney or the whole Power Rangers team dying in a pool of blood at the end of an episode. These things don't happen in a fourth grader's understanding of the world. White kids have white parents. That's your daddy? He's black? He's my mom's boyfriend. I say, eyes staring at the carpet, fingers twirling hair. But they ain't married? Marriage is the state religion. That's not in the textbooks. I barely speak to Burley that day. Benedict Arnold with a juicy juice mustache. After school, my mom tells me Burley says I acted a little strange in class. She asked what happened. I deny it, but the question festers, oozes. In a bubble bath war between G.I. Joes and Ninja Turtles, I wonder why I acted so awkward in class. It's like I'm picking a scab on a wound I don't remember getting. Something has entered me, and I was always the cultured kid. Ooh, ooh. George Washington Carver invented peanut butter before I ever read Crenshaw. I was a blind intersection. Ooh, ooh, Rosa Parks, raised at the junction of white and male, bathed in smart boy, basking proud in the slick shine of this baptism. Fourth grade is the first time I smell the gasoline and realize fire sounds like a whisper, and I too can be a burning threat. The trusted steed discovering the Trojans lurking inside it. The most days are smooth, blue certainty. This one was lightning, making lanterns of the storm clouds a jagged truth, illuminating what I hadn't seen before, the way Burley's skin always entered the room before he did, the way my grandpa pronounced the N-word just like the kid in my neighborhood, the way my father always said, your mother sure does love chocolate, and the words had become me, how I became silenced holding an X-Men lunchbox, my body, a slur spoken in my inside voice, a parakeet whistling Dixie all along. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank y'all. Thank you so much. Oh, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll invite Derek back to the stage. I really appreciate the opportunity to share a little piece from the show. And thank you all for coming out. And hopefully, uh, maybe if any of you all live in the New York area, you'll come out on October 6th to United Solo when I, when I have the show. Much love. Peace, y'all. All right, friends. This is way too high for me. Uh, um, so we're at, uh, we're at a lunch break, but let me just explain. Um, at 12.45 in this space, which is 25 minutes from now, we'll be beginning Lub Dub uh, Theater Company's uh, 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 stage reading of Miranda Rose Hall's A Play for the Living in a Time of Extinction. Um, at 1 p.m. in the Divine Theater, we'll be beginning Ephraim Mansour's How to Have Fun in a Civil War, which will be followed by an excerpt from Imagination, Stays, Oy, Imagine, Imagination Stages, Oya May the Beautiful, which are sort of going to be in, in dialogue in that conversation. Um, that's about a 50-minute play with then a 10 or 15-minute excerpt after it, and this is um, a 75-minute reading that will then go into a not so much a traditional post-show discussion, but a more expansive panel moderated by Roberta Levito with Jessica Grindstaff from Phantom Limb and Annalisa Diaz and the Love and the Love Dub team talking about um, grief and hope and climate uh, and climate and performance work. So you have good hard choices to make, and there's lots of food in portable. Uh, there's l box lunches as well as bagels and other portable things that you can eat uh, hopefully quickly, but also sneak things, you know, uh, quietly into 